Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We'll be getting started in just one minute. So today's webinar is sponsored by X-Rite. X-Rite has some of my favorite tools for color editing. And if you just start to put some of them into your workflow, you're going to find they're going to save you a lot of time and money and a lot of headaches. And you're going to be able to get uh, great color much better. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. So go on to xrightphoto.com. There's a lot of great educational materials there as well. And it's some time well spent. And I am your host today. Uh, you, some of you, um, many of you guys have uh, spent time with me online before. Uh, today, I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of the the guest webinar speaker, uh, because a little bit differently, what I'm here to show you today are techniques that I have uh, learned and uh, figured out over the many years that I've been using Photoshop. I've been teaching Photoshop since around 1991. Hard to imagine. It's been that part of my, that much of my life for that long. So I've come across a lot of different techniques. Some I figured out my own. Some I've been shown by uh, many talented people out in the field. I was also an art director for, for many years. So in that kind of battlefield Photoshop editing uh, environment, you'll learn to put things together quickly. So what I'm here to show you are techniques that I have figured out over the years. And like with everything else in Photoshop, of course, there are often... 20 ways to accomplish the same end or some kind of similar end. So what I'm showing you today are nothing official from anywhere else. These are my ways of doing things, uh, but I found they work and I think you're going to enjoy them. And also as a, uh, as a guest speaker, people always ask, you know, what kind of stuff do you use? Here's a partial list of some of the equipment I use. Uh, I did mention I do love the X-Rite stuff. Uh, I have a Color Monkey Photo and I want display two and a Color Checker Passport at my side pretty much all the time because they do save me so much time. Now, I'm not going to go into extreme detail about this today. However, what I have found is that once I put a color workflow into place, that my prints come back looking like the image I see on my monitor wherever I send them. So we're going to get right into things. And again, um, I see a couple of you are having some sound issues. Uh, everyone else has got great audio, so do make sure that uh, your sound is turned up all the way on your end. Uh, you should just be seeing my screens come by. Uh, a power, it's basically a PowerPoint presentation right now, and then I'm going to be live in Photoshop. If for some reason uh, you're having a problem with either of those, then um, you might just want to exit and then rejoin, because sometimes that happens. All right, so first of all, Let's do a couple of basics with our images before we get into the editing part. And the first part is we want to make sure that we get the color right at capture. And my favorite tool to do that is the Color Checker Passport, which you see right here. And by the way, as a tease to you guys, at the end of the presentation today, I'm going to uh, give away two free Color Checker Passports. So good luck to everybody. Now what I use with the Color Checker Passport for is to get my colors nailed down right from the get-go. I will use it for white balance, I'll, I'll use, do a custom white balance with it, and I will use the color charts in order to uh, create a custom profile for my camera, and you're going to get to see the effect that they have um, when we go into Adobe Camera Raw. Uh, the one last thing I'll tell you guys is definitely you want to make sure you stay away from auto white balance. Uh, if you don't have time to custom white balance, uh, make sure that you just pick a setting. If it's daylight, pick daylight. If it's cloudy, pick cloudy, etc. Because that's going to make your color editing much easier down the road. Uh, one of the advantages of having an auto white balance is, or disadvantage of having auto white balance is, every time someone enters the scene, somebody new shows up, it's going to change the exposure and the, the color a little bit. And that's really bad when you're doing portraits, especially if you're putting together an album uh, and you've got, you know, let's say it's a wedding album, you've got a bunch of people, a bunch of different shots on a page. If the skin tone's a little bit different from uh, shot to shot, that, that's just not very attractive looking. So you want to be consistent. I'll, and I'll, I'll show you what happens with the, uh, the camera profiles when we go into Adobe Camera Raw. Now the next step, and uh, you, many of you have heard me talk about this before, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but before you do any editing, you've got to use a piece of hardware to make sure your monitor is calibrated and profiled. Uh, if you're going to be doing any of your own printing, then I would recommend you take a look at the Color Monkey. Uh, for those of you, uh, many portrait people, you're sending your stuff out to 
uh, lab, as uh, I do with our, all of our wedding and portrait work from our studio. And for that, you need something like a colorimeter will do you just fine, like the i1 Display 2. Now, what these software and hardware combinations will do, it, one, it's going to get your color on your screen set correctly. And think about it, that's where all your editing decisions are being made. So if your color on your screen isn't right, then how can you possibly make editing decisions uh, for your prints? The other thing that it gets under control is your monitor brightness. And I hear this all the time from my PPA friends, from professional photographers. They get their prints back from the lab darker than they looked on their monitor. Well, it's almost universally the case that their monitor is set too bright. You've got to get that under control. And by the way, for you guys looking at this right now, if this image over here on the right looks great on your monitor, then your monitor is set way too bright because that image is way dark. You've got to get that under control. If you get your monitor calibrated and profiled, you're going to have an accurate depiction on the screen of what is the data really in your file. And that means that the prints are going to come back looking like they did on your screen. And that's a really important part. You don't want to send out to get a book done. You don't want to send out to have prints at your lab or a wedding album and have the prints come back dark. You want it to be right from the get-go. And if you follow um, these guidelines, if you get your monitor profiled and calibrated, then you're going to be able to get prints back that look like they did on your screen. Now, I'm just going to throw these up here. I'm not doing a detailed monitor calibration demonstration today. Uh, we have other webinars that will do that. If you're interested, uh, check out the schedule on xrightphoto.com under the Learning tab under Webinars. Uh, I will be posting in the next couple of days January webinars where I will do monitor calibration and a detailed once over on how to use the Color Checker Passport and create profiles. In the meantime, people always ask me for these settings. Now these settings don't exist on your monitor. This is what shows up um, when you run your software for the calibration device, be it the i1 Display 2 or the Color Monkey. Luminance is your brightness. You want to make sure it's somewhere between 80 and 120. And 120 is on the high end. Uh, I generally don't let any of my monitors personally go above 100, but it depends on your working environment. Uh, one of the options that the softwares do offer uh, for you is that you can set your brightness based on the ambient light. At 80 uh, candelas, by the way, that's the, the uh, measurement, at 80, the monitor is a little dim if you're in a brightly lit room. But if you're in a dimly lit room, it's probably the best place to have your monitor set because at 80, you're going to have really great details in both your shadows and highlights. Uh, by the way, a couple of people asked, uh, um, are you being charged for this, this webinar? And the answer is, of course not. This is free. Uh, so enjoy. If you want to send me money, that's fine, but uh, uh, it's free. Uh, color temperature. Now, this gets debated a lot. There are some labs that tell you to have a color temperature of 5000K rather than 6500K, and I'm going to, in my opinion, I'm going to say uh, they're wrong. Uh, 6500K is the native color temperature of most monitors that are out there. If you try to force them down to a warmer color temperature, you may pull it off, but unless you have a really high-end monitor, chances are you're going to throw off uh, the curves particularly in the shadow areas, and you're going to have some color shifts. Not a good idea. Your monitor's native color temperature is typically 6500K, and that's what they're going to perform best at. Now, for you Mac people, you might have used, been used to using a gamma setting of 2.2, and that, or 1.8 rather, and now everybody is, is 2.2, whether you're on a Mac or a PC. So these are the settings you're going to want to set in your software when you run it. Now, when you run it, use a device like uh, the i1 Display 2, which you see here sitting on my monitor, what it's going to do is, the so after we do those settings, uh, you just dial them into the software, they're a drop-down menu, the software is going to send colors up to the screen. It's going to kind of look like this. And as these colors go by, the device reads what shows up. Now, these are all known values. Uh, let's say that's supposed to be 100% yellow, for example. Well, the device reads it, and for argument's sakes, let's say it's not 100% yellow. It's, let's say it's got a little bit of, I don't know, it's got 5% of red in it. The comparison of the known values versus what gets read by this device is what a profile is created from. In essence, a monitor profile is a set of corrections based on those known values versus what gets read in. And you can't do this stuff by eye. You need hardware and software to do this. And by running it this way, 
the soft with the profile automatically gets created, automatically gets saved, put in the right place and implemented, and then you're good to go. Now somebody asks if you have a color monkey, why would you need this too? You wouldn't. Uh, the color monkey does this as well. I'm showing you the i1 display too today because this is a device that just does monitors. It does a really good job with it, but that's all it does. And if you're sending out to a lab, then uh, a colorimeter like you see here is perfect. Uh, if you're doing your own printing, or if you want to calibrate, say, say a digital LCD projector, then you need a color monkey, again, a subject for another day. So whatever device you choose, and there's, there's, you see three listed here, the i1 display, the color monkey, and the i1 Pro, just make sure you are doing it with a device. You can't do it by eye. Uh, and if you go on to xrightphoto.com, again, there is lots of uh, videos and tutorials and details where you can show this, uh, see how this works, rather. All right, we're going to go into Photoshop. Now, again, we're talking about portrait editing today. And we're just going to jump right into it. So let's go into Photoshop. I'm going to hide the other stuff. And I'm going to open up Bridge and bring up some images. And I'm going to start right here with my number one set of images. I'll try to get through as much as I can. Uh, also, for those of you that are talking about uh, dealing with a lab and how do you make sure that your prints come back, I'm going to show you something about soft proofing for a lab when we get there. There's really no reason, there's no reason for you to need to have a profile from the lab because your lab's equipment is all operating under a color space very similar to sRGB. So what our job is going to be is to make sure that we've got an image that is calibrated on to sRGB color space and saved that way. And when we do that, the software that the lab has is very good at taking that sRGB calibrated file you send them and translating it into their, their printer's color space. More on that later. We'll get into that when we get into, uh, we'll do some soft proofing. Okay, so I opened a couple images. Now, some of them were, a couple of these were raw. These are my base files I wanted to show you. Now, the first thing you need to do is create a profile. And it's very, sim very simple to do. You just select your image that has uh, your, your target in it. Here we see it with the color checker. Click on Save Image. Now, when I'm in Photoshop, I do need to save my image as a DNG file. It's the only time you ever have to save a raw file as a DNG for that calibration image. So I just click on save and you can even see, you might have even noticed that uh, uh, the DNG was the default. Now I'm not dealing with any color spaces, no white balance, no nothing. All I have to do is save the image with the target in it as a DNG file. Then, let me just make this window a little smaller. I would then go into the Color Checker Passport software. And the Color Checker Passport software is where you generate the profile when you're dealing with Photoshop. And it's very simple to run. It's as simple as adding the file into the software. So I would just go into my folder that we were just in, scroll down till I find my DNG file. And let me do a different view here so we can actually see them. Okay, here's our DNG. Click on open, and what, what happens is the software then goes finds the target in there. Now remember, I didn't have to white balance um, because the software knows which of those patches are neutral, and it will do its own kind of internal white balance during the process. So here you see it found the target. I simply click on create profile, give it a name and save it, and that's it. We're done. That's how easy it is to create a camera profile. Where do you see what it does? Now, I'm not going to go ahead and save this because I already did. As I like to say, just like any good cooking show, I had one in the oven for you already. So let's maximize our window. Now, when I'm in Adobe Camera Raw, a couple things I'll do is, well, first I'll check my exposure. This is a little hot. So I'm just going to bring the exposure down. And I can turn on up here my shadow warnings and my highlight warnings to see if anything's blown out. I do have a little bit of fringe highlight showing up in a couple of squares, pretty minor. You can bring in a little recovery to bring that back. Uh, I'm not seeing any shadow warnings, which would show up as blue. I'll add a little fill light to add to the shadows. <clears throat> now, 
in the past, all we had to deal with was white balance. And I can actually white balance off this target. If I click here, I can pick one of these grays. I like to come one in and click there. And there's the actual white balance on the scene. Now, if you had done a white balance off the wall, which did kind of maybe look uh, neutral, watch what happens. Uh, it's actually different than the true white balance in the scene. So this wall was not actually a neutral color. By having the target available, I get the exact color. Now, you may not like it. You may prefer something uh, warmer or cooler, and that's your prerogative. You can then change the color temperature to what you like. If you want to make it a little cooler or warmer, I can bring it down. I can bring it up. That's your personal preference. But this was the actual white balance of this scene with these lights. Now, before I do any color adjustments, I want to apply the camera profile because I want to see what it's going to do. Now, notice these colors here. If I'm going to zoom in a little bit more, we're looking at the the standard Adobe the Adobe standard camera profile right here. And take a look at these colors. Take a look at the blues, the reds, and in particular the top of her dress. Uh, I've shown I've shown some of you this image before. It's kind of a very odd color green. It was very difficult to photograph, and even with a white balance, it came in wrong. So watch what happens when we apply the profile. I'm going to move this over just a little bit. Take a look at the colors in the chart and the dress, and watch what happens when we apply the profile. So here's the profile. And this was our friend Hazel. That's why the profile is called Hazel. And look what it did to the colors. That's the color dress she was wearing. Also, take notice of the target. See how the colors are shifting? What this is giving me is all the colors back. I'm getting a much uh, more accurate response because rather than just having white balance to deal with, I've got all 24 patches here that I can get my profile from. So look at the difference in the color. Now I've got everything back the way I want it. And the beautiful thing now is, at this point, the color editing part, unless I want to do things subjective, is done for my images. And I could select all the images in the shoot, click on Synchronize, and I want to apply the white balance and the camera calibration. Click on OK, and I can look at my next image, and good to go. Now I can make further edits in Adobe Camera while I'm here. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to add a little more fill light to this particular frame. Let's do that first. just want to bring up those shadows a smidge. I might darken some areas again later, but I just saw me after the shadows on the side of the face here. And I can see from my histogram that I've got no um, shadow clipping and I've got no highlight blowouts, so I'm very good here. And somebody asked, can you do this in Lightroom? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, basically, if you think about it, Lightroom, a big part of Lightroom is it's like a giant Adobe Camera Raw, which is what we're dealing with right here. All of the same kind of things apply. Now, I'm not going to do my sharpening and things in here. I'm going to leave that alone. Now, this was also shot at ISO 100, so my noise is going to be very low. I can zoom in and take a look. Let's go all the way to 100%. And I really don't have any noise to deal with. This, I'll show you an image that's got noise a little later. So no, no, really no reason here to do any noise reduction. So I'm happy with what they, the image looks like. Now I'm going to open it. Now down at the bottom of Adobe Camera Raw is your workflow. It looks like a link to a website. It's actually your color workflow options. And here's where uh, you decide what your settings are going to be. What color space am I going to be dealing with? I'm going to assume today I'm preparing an image to go out to a lab, which means that my lab wants sRGB, so that's what I'm going to choose. Now, depending on how much editing I'm going to do, if I'm going to do a real serious bit of editing, uh, if I might want to you know, run it through some softwares, which I'm going to show you, I'm going to go to 16 bits, because that's going to give me more flexibility and more latitude to do some serious edits. Then I have my resolution. And this image, actually, I had already cropped a little bit. Um, just for speed's sake, I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. I'll just uh, I'll downsize it to uh, this resolution just to, to keep things moving. If I was going out to a lab and was going to have a big print done, then I might go to one of the, the bigger settings. But for this, that's OK. Then I'll click Open Image. And my image will open with those settings already applied to it. And let's just let this finish opening. Just a uh, 
Let's see. Now, this was Adobe, for those of you who haven't seen this before, that was Adobe Camera Raw. We're now in Photoshop. Adobe Camera Raw, however, is where a lot of the editing is going to take place. You want to get your color set correctly, and you want to have your exposure and everything else done that you can do in Adobe Camera Raw before you do open in Photoshop. So here we are in Photoshop, and I'm going to go into one that I've already got starting to be uh, processed. First thing I'm going to do, here's the process that I use. First thing I'll do is do a uh, duplicate of the background so that I can do some retouching to the image. And e two ways to do that, I can either drag it to the folded page down here, or I can hit Command or Control on a PC, uh, Control J, to give me a copy of the background. And then I will do my edits. That's typically the first thing I'll do. So let me zoom in here. And I've got a little bit of editing to do. So I'm going to use the lasso tool and just select around. And by the way, somebody asked, um, I'm actually presenting to you on my laptop today. So I am doing all of this with my trackpad, believe it or not. Uh, I do use a Wacom tablet when I'm in my home studio. Uh, at the very least, I would use a mouse. But today, I'm actually presenting to you on my laptop. So that's, whoops, didn't want that last one. So that's what I'm using. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is just fix that small bit. Oh, a couple, one more thing here. And I just hold down the Shift key to add to any places. And our friend Hazel Hair has very good skin, so not much in the way of editing to do. And what I like to do when I have a small bit of editing like this is then go to Edit, Fill. And this is something new to CS5. This doesn't exist in earlier versions. And that's use the Content Aware Fill and click on OK and let Photoshop do the work. And you can see as I click this on and off, just that quickly, it gets rid of any of the small blemishes I want to correct. There's one little weird thing going on here. It might have been left over from another image edit. I'm going to zoom in there. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. So I'm going to bring up the stamp tool. And <clears throat> here's another shortcut that will save you so much time during your editing. I brought up uh, the stamp tool. and Many of you guys, I know you make your brushes bigger and smaller by using the left and right bracket keys. Or you'd come up to the stamp, uh, the brush size here and adjust the size. I'm going to show you a better way to do that. What you want to do is hold down Control Option on a, P on a Mac. Uh, or I think it is, help me, help, help me you PC guys, it's Alt. I think Control or Command Alt on a PC hold down control option as you drag left and right it changes the size of your brush and this works for anything that is a brush any of the healing tools any of the brushes if you drag up and down it changes the edge hardness and by just having this two key two key combination held in you get this control and it will save you a lot of time so i'm going to make it a little smaller i'm going to hold down option uh, anytime i say option i am working on a mac today Anytime I say Option, it's also Alt for a PC, and Command is Control. So I'm going to Alt Option from there, and I'm just going to fix that little spot that somehow showed up there. Good, okay. That's all I really had to do with my retouch, because, uh, well, face it, she has, uh, she's got very good skin. However, everybody, especially when we're dealing with models, can deal with a little smoothing. We don't like to seem to like pores on our models. So what I'm going to do is use, again, um, my other favorite technique that I like to do for skin, more for the women's side than the men, although I'll do it for the men a little bit less, is I will use my favorite blur. Now, before I do this, I want to create a new layer that is a composite of everything else that I've done, because I might want to keep these. And it's called stacking. If you hold down Alt or Option and go to the Flyout menu here, and then hold or choose Merge Visible, what happens is you get a flattened part of the image. You get the image flattened, in essence, but you get to keep your layers. So it's like flattening, but you get your layers back as well. And the reason I want to do this is because I'm going to want to be able to mask some of the other image below back in. I'm going to run my skin filter that I like the most. And that is under Blur and Surface Blur. Now the settings are going to vary depending on the skin of the person. Now it's a little bit high. You can see we get the real big blur there. I'm going to bring it down to, let's see what 1725 does. 
I want to get I want to get some back, but I want it to be too much because I'm going to start bringing it back. But you can see it's smoothed out the skin. Actually, I'm seeing some a little bit of roughness in here, so I am going to bring those numbers back up to something really high because there are some areas I might want to add more than in others. So let's see what that does. Yeah, that's a little better. So I hit OK. Now, of course, that isn't the image we want, <clears throat> although you could certainly use that. It's a technique all on its own. But what I want to do is just apply that on the parts of the skin that I feel needs it. So what I'm going to do is add a mask to this. Now, since I want to just start bringing in, I, want to, I don't want it to affect the rest of the image. Again, if I hold down Alt or Option and click on the mask, it gives me a mask filled with black rather than one filled with white, and it hides everything that I just did. Then using the X key, I will switch from black to white as my paintbrush and bring up a brush. Now since I have a black mask, I need to paint with white. I'm going to make my brush kind of big and a little bit softer edge. Again, I'm holding down uh, Control Option to change the size and the hardness of the brush. And I'm going to start with an opacity around, you know, let's try 30% and see what that does. And again, the shortcut for that is, rather than go up to the opacity slider and drag this back and forth, or I could put my cursor over the word opacity and drag it up and down by doing that. Uh, I like to work in generally in tens. So if I wanted 50%, I just type 5 on my keyboard. If I wanted 70%, I type 7. If I wanted 100%, you type 0. All right, so let's see, I decided 30%. So I'm going to type 30% uh, and I'm going to start painting white in the areas of the skin that I want to smooth. And I'm going to come up here on the forehead. I'm actually going to go a little heavier. I'm going to go 50%. So I just type 5. Notice it changed to 50. Make my brush a little smaller so I can fit around the lips. And I'll smooth out the chin and you can see it's kind of like we're applying digital makeup here. If I could find a way to get this to work in re real life, actually hook electrodes up to people and make this happen, I could retire a happy man. And I'm going to make it a little smaller and bring it down about 30 percent again. I'm just going to smooth out this makeup above the eye. Now she, again, she's got very nice skin, so really nothing going on here in the neck and the top of her chest. So we'll leave that alone. But again, just that little quick thing, let's see what we've done. We went from there to there. We've got much smoother skin. Now on the lips, I can zoom in and decide, okay, I'm going to smooth that as well. Go back up to 50% just in the middle of the lip. Shrink down a little more. And I see a spot I can go ahead. <clears throat> I could go ahead and clean that up with my brush should I want to. And I can take a look at the mask, by the way, to see what I've done by holding again down Alt or Option and clicking on the mask, and that will show me the mask. So that's what we've done so far. And if I want to make sure that the transitions that I'm using are smooth, I can also click on this icon, which is the mask uh, editor, and feather this. And watch as I see the number increase, you'll start to see the mask start to blur a little bit. That's a little too much. Yeah, just a little bit like that. That will ensure that I have a smoother transition. And then if I just click on the image again, I've got it. So now I've got a nice, smooth skin. And it's not too much. Even though we did apply that surface blur so that it was a lot, just by starting to put it back in, uh, we just were able to selectively take control of that. Now the next thing I'll do is I maybe want to shape the light a little bit more. And to do that, I'm going to do some burning and dodging uh, using an uh, overlay layer. Now, if you were, by the way, if you haven't version earlier than CS5 and you don't have that, that mask adjustment layer, if you click on Alt uh, and just to let, take a look at the mask, you can go up to Filter, Blur, and just blur the mask using something like the Gaussian Blur. And you can make your changes here. So that's, that is a way that you, it was done in the past. Uh, I apologize, by the way, thank you for your questions. Getting a lot of good questions today. 
Um, but, there's, but there's a lot of them. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, if I see a question that is something I'm going to, uh, to answer again, or uh, just stay tuned, I will answer it. Uh, I will show you um, some of these same techniques on some different images, so stay tuned. And uh, like the stacking, always, people always ask about the stacking. Yes, I'll show you that again, because I use that all the time. And that's that composite layer uh, that I'll show you. So I've got my image. Now it's time to uh, add my shaping of light. And again, for those of you that joined us late, yes, the webinar is being recorded. So <clears throat> excuse me, give, me uh, give us 24 hours to send you out an email with a link to the recorded version. All right, so I want to shape the, shape the lighting a little bit more. I want to really have you directed on her face. And I find that this background is maybe a little too light. And this part of her uh, the, the bottom of her neck and the, the top of her chest is a little too hot. So let's create a blank layer. And I do that by clicking right here. And I'm going to change this to overlay. And before I go any further, I'm going to fill this layer with 50% gray. Now notice nothing happened. If I looked at it under normal, you'll see that it just is 50% gray. But overlay changes the brightness of the image. Anything brighter than 50% gray will lighten the image. Anything darker than 50% gray will uh, darken the image. So at 50% gray, nothing happens. But if I bring up a brush, so I'll just hit B to bring up my brush, I'll get a nice big one, and I'll paint usually about 20% when I'm, I'm dealing with lightening and darkening. And I'm just going to paint off on the background here. And again, this is cumulative. I just want to shade this and kind of vignetting a little bit. Good. I can try it here on the skin. Oftentimes, I don't like the effect that uh, this type of burning and dodging has on a skin. But just a little bit there is OK. I may want to bring this down a little more a little later. I also want to lighten up this side of her face just a smidge. So I'll switch to white, give myself a little smaller brush. And I'm going to bring my opacity down to 10% so that I can have a little better control and just cumulatively add on there. I hope I made that a little dark. OK, so if I switch this to normal, you get to see what it is we just did. That's what we just did to the image. That's where we adjusted the shading. And <clears throat> this is not a mask. This is a layer. So I do see a little bit of banding going on there. So I want my to smooth that by adding a blur here. So I'm going to bring up my Gaussian blur. And let's see, I'll try a bigger number to smooth that. Let's see, let it catch up. And maybe even a little more. OK, looking a little better. <clears throat> so hit OK on that. Change this back to overlay. And we've reshaped the light. So let's take a look. We'll turn this on and off and watch what effect this had. Very quickly, what we were able to do. Look at the difference in the image you were now more directed to her face. That background is less of a distraction, even though we have a slight bit of glow around her, which really works. The last step I'll do for this particular edit is I'm going to do a little bit of sharpening. So I'm going to do that stack one more time, that composite. And by the way, I filled the layer with 50% gray under Edit Fill. And there it is. It's one of the options. You'll see foreground, background, 50% gray is an option. If you want to do it the old-fashioned manual way, some of the earlier versions of Photoshop did not offer that. Uh, what you would need to do, and let me just show you this real quick because it, that is handy to know. If you're not in CS4 or 5, I'll create a new layer here. If I wanted to fill this with 50% gray and I did not have an option in my menu, go to your color picker and just type 128 for each of the red, greens, and blues. Bring up my layer and hit Option or Alt Delete. That fills with the foreground color, and you just accomplished the same thing. So good question. Thank you for that. But we don't need this, because we already had one. All right, so I'm going to do that composite layer, because I want to do sharpening now. But I, I don't want to sharpen the whole image. I want to sharpen the eyes, maybe a little bit of her mouth, and maybe the jewelry, and that's it. I want everything else to be soft or less sharp. So again, I've got all my layers that I want visible. Hold down Alt or Option. Come up to the flyout menu here and click on Merge Visible. So now I have that composite stacked image, but I have all my layers intact. And you'll see in a, in in a couple of demonstrations coming up ahead that uh, there's a lot of good reasons for doing this.
Uh, somebody asked, why don't I just dodge and burn the layer? There's an advantage to doing it with this overlay because I can always bring back that 50% gray as a brush and paint it out. So uh, it just gives me a little more flexibility. But again, like I said when we started, there are 20 different ways to accomplish the same end. What I'm showing you today are a set of techniques that I've worked out over the years that really work for me. There might be some things you like that I do and some things you don't like. But take what you can and put it to use and adjust it to your own likings. So here's my layer that's ready to be sharpened. And my favorite sharpening technique for skin tones is Smart Sharpen. And I use a setting that might be a little different than what you're used to seeing. My default setting for most of my DSLR work is this. It's 180 with a radius of 0.8. Now, 180 is really high, but having this radius below 1 keeps you from getting uh, any kind of halos, but brings up really fine detail sharpness. Now, I turn off this preview, or if I hold down on the hand, you can see as I let go. I'm not sure how well you see it on your screen, but it definitely adds a crispness to those fine details. I recommend you give it a try. And again, I don't want the entire image to get that sharpening. We just went through some of the softening to blur the skin. So again, I'm going to add a black mask. And I'll do that again by holding down Alt or Option and clicking on the Mask Layer tool. So now I have a nice black mask. And now I'm going to bring up my brush again. I'm going to zoom in to the spots I want to sharpen. Bring up my white brush, make it about a little smaller than the size of the eye, and I'm going to work at about 80%. And I'm going to paint white over top of the spots I want sharp. And again, it's cumulative. I can just keep going over, and I'll make my brush a little smaller to fit the size of the eyebrow. Now, the eyebrows <clears throat> are kind of straight lines. So again, as a time saver, what I can do is click at the beginning of the eyebrow, go to the spot where the turn happens, hold down shift, and click. And what that does is draw a straight line in between the two. And I can do the same thing over here. Click once, shift, and click again. I can check the lips. Mm, actually, I'm going to leave them alone. The only thing I really wanted to sharpen on the face was the eyes. And I can do the same thing for the jewelry here. Let me back out a little bit. I'm going to add that Christmas back into the jewelry. And again, just hold shift click. Now, if we take a look at the mask, you'll see what's going on. We're getting these straight lines. And a little smaller for this smaller chain. Click, hold down shift, click again. And what that does is gives me just those straight line edits all the way down. And I'll just manually add a little bit here. And if, again, I hold down Alt and click on the mask, you can see what it is we're getting. Oh, for some reason I didn't catch up there. Hold on. Let me put my white back in the foreground. So click, and now I'm getting my sharpness. And that's it for that image. So what we did that quickly was we went from here to here. So we've got a much more attractive portrait and it's got a lot more uh, a lot more impact to it. Alright, so if I wanted to send this out to my lab, the last thing I'll do is do a soft proof. I'll check it. Now this image was already in sRGB so nothing's going to happen. But the soft proofing process is to go to View Proof Setup Custom and dial in <clears throat> under Device to Simulate sRGB. This is what you do if you're going out to a lab. So if your image, for example, was in Adobe RGB or Profoto RGB and you simulate sRGB, you're going to see a little bit of shift in color. Now conversely, if you're going out to your own desktop printer and I want to see how it's going to look when I go out to, oh, say, luster paper on my Epson 2880, if I click on preview, I can see a slight density change in the image. Again, I'm not sure how well you guys are seeing this on your screen, but as I turn this on and off, it's a very subtle shift. It actually gets a little bit darker. So I could make the decision at that point for my printer that I want to lighten this up a little bit, and I would simply add an adjustment layer. In this case, I'll just do a little bit of levels adjustment just to brighten up the midtones a little bit, 
and that would be how this image is going to print on the luster paper on that particular printer. Again, a subject for another day, but I just wanted to show you that real quick. Again, if you, if you really want to see soft proofing, if you really want to see the printing, uh, join me in the webinar called Beyond Monitor Calibration. Uh, I go over soft proofing in detail, and soft proofing is a really important tool for those of you doing prints. Uh, so join me on that, and that'll be coming up soon. All right, let's be done with Hazel here and go to another image. And all right, I'm bringing up my friend Rachel here. So again, the same things were done in Adobe Camera Raw to get the image in our space. But well, there's a couple of changes I want to make. First of all, I think the background is a little too light. It's competing with her. So I'm going to do my kind of overall really big edits first before going into the fine edits. And what I'm going to do is duplicate my background layer and I'm going to change the blending mode from normal, which is right here, to multiply. Now for those of you who are new to blending modes, if you take a look at them, they're grouped by functionality. Uh, the first grouping here, any of these will darken an image. The second group, these will lighten an image. The third group will affect contrast. Uh, this fourth group is kind of a weird group. Um, uh, differences is used in HDR and lining up uh, images. I've actually never used the rest of the other three. And then this last group obviously is for color. So if I change the blending mode of this from normal to multiply, you can see that it darkens the image. Now I've got the background kind of looking the way I want. I like that, but she's too dark. So I need to add a mask. And just real quickly, I'm going to bring up a big brush. And I'm at 80% again, so I'm just going to paint with black. I'm put black in the foreground here because I have a white mask to bring her back. And I'm just going to do this roughly again. Yes, I'm working with my trackpad today, so I really have to remember to bring my tablet in. All right, but just by doing that, we went from there to there. We've got the background. It's not competing as much with her. And sh if I should decide to do so, if I thought the background was a little too dark, I can just bring the opacity of this layer down a little bit and I can adjust it to the way I want. I think about there is pretty good. All right. So again, like we did before, I'm going to do my stack because now I'm going to do some retouching. And again, to do that composite stack, hold down Alter Option. And while that's held down, choose Merge Visible. So I have my stacked layer here. And I'm going to go in and look at the face. And again, Rachel has really, really nice skin. So I'm just going to do a couple of little uh, edits. I'm whole, I got the lasso tool. And I do a circle. Now by holding down the shift, it will add to it. And I'm just going to pick the few small areas that I want to edit. And I've got a little glare here. There's a couple ways to deal with glare. I'll show you another one in just a sec. And okay. So once again, I'm going to go to Edit, Fill, Content Aware. Now again, this is something new to CS5. And hit Deselect. And you can see we went from there to there. Now I did get a little bit of a smudge here on the edge of her nose. That's okay because I'm going to bring this layer down. Generally when you're dealing with somebody, especially with an older person, if they have a lot of wrinkles under the eyes, you'll go ahead and do this this filling and do it at 100% and it'll look kind of weird actually. You'll be turning people into mannequins. The trick then is to bring the opacity down. I'm going to bring that multiply, la the, uh, multiply layer down or the opacity layer down so that it starts to come back and when you do that you get a completely natural look. Now, if there are wrinkles they start to show up a little bit through that um, but not objectionably. All right now another way by the way let me uh, I'll create another stack layer for you real quick just to show you another way you could do this is to bring up your stamp tool. Yes, there are lots of different ways to do edits. I could use the spot healing brush. I could use the healing brush. I could use the patch tool. Uh, if I'm dealing with glare, though, I typically like to use the stamp tool. However, what I'll do is change the blending mode of the stamp tool, which is up top here, from normal to darken. And what that means is it's only going to apply that color if what you're painting over is lighter than where you're sampled from. 
So if I zoom in on the nose here, and I want to get rid of that, I'll come up with my stamp tool, give myself a smaller brush. I'll work at about 60 or 70 percent. Let's try 70 percent. I'll sample from here, and you can see it looks darker on the spot, but we're not at 100 percent. And I click once, and that was a little too hot, a little too hard. Let's try 50 percent. And that works. Same thing over here for the cheek. I can just select an area and this little bit of the nose and voila. Let's look at that at 100 percent. So that's another way to get rid of that glare. You can see I just got rid of that right there. And again, to smooth it off, I will sometimes bring the opacity back just a little bit. That blends it in. All right. Now here's one that everybody is going to love. I do this with so many of our portraits, especially at weddings, uh, especially with bridesmaids and brides, everybody wearing these strapless dresses, has a tendency to make even skinny people um, make their arms look big. Now, Rachel is very thin, but for some reason her arm on this side did end up looking bigger than it really should be, and I don't want you to be drawn to that. So I'm going to take my stacked layer and bring up the lasso tool. Now some people like to use Liquify to do this and in the past that's the tool that I generally use. But Liquify is a little bit squirrely to use. That can be a little bit difficult so I'm going to show you an easier way. I'm going to select right down the middle of the arm and a little bit outside. And I'm going to copy and paste this and as soon as I do that it puts it on a new layer. So that's what's on the new layer. And what I'm going to use is the warp tool. So what I do is go to Edit, Transform, Warp. And that gives me this grid that I can then start moving around. So as I drag in on any of these lines, you can see that I'm getting to thin her arm. And I can also drag out here. And you just get it to the way you want it. And I think that's pretty good right there. I just hit Enter. And look what we've done for the arm. We went from there to there. Now, I do need to add a mask to fix those areas where the transition happened. So I'll just put a mask in, bring up my brush, set it a little bit smaller. I've got it set to black. I'm going to deal with about 60%. And just over that border, I will just go ahead where I see that border. Oh, I got some of the old arm back. Put that back where it was. So just where I see this border, I'll just get rid of that and then I get a nice smooth result. I keep spazzing out with my trackpad here so let me get rid of that. Actually just go up to 100% and put it back. So here what we just did by doing that is we took the arm that seemed a little bit too much and made it thin again to take it away. I use this on, uh, on chins and waists all the time. Uh, I'll sh and I, everybody loves that. I'll show you another example in, a, in another image in just a minute. So okay, that's a big favorite. Let's get a couple more things finished here. Now I'm going to use my composite again. I'm going to stack this. So Alt, Merge Visible. I'm going to run the surface blur like we saw before. So I'm going to go to Filter, Blur, Surface Blur. And not quite as heavy on Rachel because she has really good skin. I'm going to go about 1725. And you can see, yes, it makes her look like a cartoon practically, like a Barbie doll. But that's all right because, again, we're going to mask this out. Hold down Alter Option, click on Mask, and I'll bring my brush back. Now, one of the beauties of Surface Blur is not only does it smooth the skin on the face, but it's great on arms and legs. A lot of times you've probably seen maybe somebody's got a tan or it's starting to peel or they were a little chilly and they've got a little bit of uh, uh, goosebumps going on. As you can see here we have some modeling on her arm. The surface blur will get rid of that. So let's bring up a brush. Now I got a black mask. I want to bring it back so I'm painting with white. And I'll give myself a nice big brush and I'm going to work at 50 percent and watch what happens to the skin as I paint over this it smooths away all that stuff. Very nice. Do the same thing on her shoulder here. And again guys, you can have a lot more control of this if you use a sketch tablet or even a mouse. I'm using my trackpad as I mentioned. 
And the same thing on the neck. You can see just a little bit of goosebumps. There's a little chilly out. And then lastly, I'll come up to the face. Same thing. By the way, surface blur also has the effect of lightening those highlights a little bit as well. Especially, any, also even a stray hair will blend that in a bit. So last up here, I'll do the bridge of her nose. The other cheek, make it a little smaller and come in above the lip. Again, I'm doing this really quickly, but you can see, I want you to see the before and after, how amazing this technique is, what it does for skin. Trust me, the girls will love this. And actually, I do it on guys too, just usually at a little bit lower opacity. So that quickly, look what we did for the skin. How amazing is that? We went from there. Oops, that was our warp. Went from there to there. Look at the beautiful effect it has on the skin softening. Love it. All right, let's move on to another image. Holy cow, It's I've only got eight minutes left, and i got a lot to show you. Uh, so you know what? So what I'm going to do, uh, I know some of you signed up for both sessions. I've got a, uh, uh, I've got a uh, second uh, webinar session coming up at 3 p.m. What I've decided to do, this happened to me when I did a landscape webinar last week. I had so much prepared, and really an hour is not enough time. I've got about four hours worth of stuff for you. So what I'm going to do in the afternoon session is I'm going to use a different set of images and a slightly different set of edits. So if you wanted to join me again, or uh, if you don't have time, if you want to watch the second session, when we send you the uh, link to the recording, I'll include both. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat the 3 p.m. session almost as a part two of what we're doing today. So we can get right into it and uh, do some maybe a couple of more advanced things. So let's be finished with Rachel and <clears throat> let's do something a little special effecty going to add a little bit of extra. So I'm going to open up this image and I'm going to add one more. I want to bring up this image of the waterfall here. And yeah, I'm gonna, that's pretty good. I'm just going to open it as is. Because what I'm going to use is I want the texture of the water. I'm not really that concerned with the image. And uh, yes, for those of you that ask, both record. What, what we'll do is we'll send you links to the recording so that you can watch them whenever you like. Okay, so this is our good friend Rick Salmon. And I teach workshops with Rick a couple of times a year. He invites me up to his workshops. And uh, he let me take this picture. So I, I, I sent him an email the other day say, hey, Rick, can I use your image as a demo? And by the way, <laughs> this was a kind of a funny story. Um, Many people did not know what this symbol on the front of his shirt was. Uh, now, this I guess this is an age thing. For those of us that are older, uh, we not understand that this is an insert for a 45 record to be put on a turntable. But for you youngsters out there who have no idea what a 45 is and never seen it, somebody thought uh, at one of his workshops that this symbol was some kind of strange uh, signif signifier of flying phallic symbols uh, sp spun around some kind of hole. I don't know why, but anyway, I guess it's an age thing. So here, what I want to do for Rick is I want to add some kind of special effect stuff to, to him. And what I'm going to do is do something that, this works really well for seniors, by the way. Uh, I want to uh, add a little more interest to it. So I'm going to go to that other image of the waterfall, and I'm going to do a select all and copy it. And then I'm just going to close the image. And what I'm going to do is paste this over top of this image. So I just hit Command W. Uh, again, it's a different color space, but I don't care because I'm after the texture of it. And I see that it's smaller. But since I'm going to use it as an overlay, watch this. So I hit Command T to transform this. And I want to fill the image with it. And go a little bit over. OK, so I hit Enter. So now I've just got this image over top of this. Watch this. Watch what happens. I just click on the layer, change it from normal to overlay. Remember, we're using overlay for burn and dodge. Watch what it does when you put another image over top. It gives us a really cool effect. Look at this. I'll turn this on and off. Whenever I'm out shooting, uh, the first thing I will do as I'm looking around is I will take pictures of odd textures, of interesting textures, because I use this a lot. So I've got this on an overlay. It's added this really cool effect to it. And what I'm going to do is I am going to add a mask because I'm going to bring back the skin. So I'm going to go up to the face here. 
I even kind of like it on the skin. In fact, I'm going to leave it in the glasses. I really like it there. But I'm going to give myself a brush and put black in the foreground. I'm working about 60%. And I'm going to start to bring back the skin on his face to normal. And make it a little smaller to get the nose. I'm going to work a little heavier. I'm going to go to 70%. I'm going to get the forehead. I'm even going to leave his hair alone and let the, the uh, overlay shine through his hair. All right. So I'm going to do the same thing for his arm. Just paint over top of that. And I'm going to do that shift trick where I just do the straight lines. Again, I hit click go up to where I want it to drag to, click shift, and it draws a straight line in between the two spots. And again, I'm doing this roughly. If this was going to be an image that I was going to seriously have printed large, then I would be a little more careful with it. So I'll do the fingers on this hand. Somebody asked what happened to Rick's finger on the other hand. I actually forget what happened that day, but uh, we're going to fix this finger too while we're at it. And just got the other arm to do. Again, real quickly, just fix that, and we'll zoom in on his injured finger, and bring the fingers back, because we're going to fix that in just a bit. This is actually kind of a rainy, muddy day where we were out here, and uh, I don't know where Rick was, but he's got dirty fingernails, so we're going to fix that too. All right, so right there, already really pretty cool. Look what we just accomplished by doing that. We went from there to there. Very cool effect. And you can see that we were able to mask out the skin. Now, one of the cool things about having a layer is I can just adjust the layer, too. If I decide I do want it to be more opaque, I can do a levels adjustment on the layer and bring it up and make it darker. And darken this. You can see what I just did was darkened everything I just did. So when I go to here, now I made that more opaque, but I left it in his hair. I left it in the sunglasses because I thought it was pretty cool. Now I'm going to do a little bit of use saturation adjustment. I'm going to add a little saturation to this and see what it does as I drag up. Yeah, that's cool. Like it. And the last thing I'm going to do is fix this finger. So I'm going to do a stack to do that, because I want to take everything that I've got and put it on a new layer. And I'll show you re another reason for doing this. So I hold down Alt Option, go to Merge Visible, and let this stack. Now I see I'm like right up against the line here. It's 159. You guys want me to go more, a couple more five minutes? I have a couple more things I want to show you, and I want to... Uh, I uh, want to cover this, so bear with me. I'm going to go a little five. If you have to leave again, we'll send you the recording. This is being recorded, but let's just spend a couple more minutes because I want to finish this off. So I've got my stack layer, and I'm going to zoom in down on the hand. Now, the first thing I'm going to do, and I'm going to really zoom in, I'm going to fix this, clean up his fingernail here, and I'm going to use the stamp tool. And you remember earlier we did the stamp tool and we changed it to darken, in fact, it's still sitting there. This time we're going to change it to lighten. So anywhere I paint with, it's only going to have an effect on what I paint over if, it's, if what I'm painting over is darker than where I started. So I'm going to click right on the fingernail and just paint over top of that. And look at that. Nice clean fingernails that quickly. So we got to fix Rick's finger. So I'm going to grab the lasso tool. I'm going to grab just below the knuckle and hit copy paste that puts it on a new layer then I just hit V to bring up my move tool and I'll put it back in place command T will let me rotate it around it's easier to line this stuff up by the way if you change the opacity so let me just hit enter on that let me bring the opacity down a little bit make sure everything's lined up okay actually that's pretty good and then with a mask I will just blend away the spots that didn't match exactly. So a little smoother, tiny brush there with black and just along the edge. Do undo that last little bit. And also right at the joint, because the skin color was a slight bit different. 
Oop, I didn't want to get that last bit in. Just a real little bit. And look at that. All better. Now the last thing I'm going to do, just to show you what you can do with some of these masks, I'm going to add a black and white layer and then just bring his skin back. So I'm going to do a black and white adjustment layer. And I want uh, his shirt to be a little lighter. And rather than trying to figure out which way these sliders need to go, if I click on this tool right here, I can then drag left and right, and only the things that I'm over top of will change. If I do it on the background, you can see it lightens up other stuff. Hold on a second. I think I have something chosen. Let's undo that. Let's do that one more time. Make sure I hit deselect. Okay. In fact, I'm going to stack this again so that I can then do a black and white over top of that. Okay. So I'll get my tool here. I'm going to lighten up his shirt a bit. And I'm going to lighten up the background. And I'm going to just darken his skin just a smidge. All right. That's good. So here we just went to black and white. Now, if I wanted everything in the image black and white except his skin, rather than go paint all this again, remember we've created these masks before. We created this one earlier. We can use that again. All I have to do is hold down Alt or Option and drag that mask to my black and white layer. And it'll say, you want to replace it? I click on Yes, and I get back the skin. So it saves me a lot of time. I see I was a little sloppy of it, sloppy with it. So I can just go ahead bring up my black brush, go back to that layer, and I can just fill in the pieces I missed. And yes, I would do all kinds of other, inner, all kinds of other uh, uh, first aid fixes that Rick apparently got banged up this day. I see all little cuts and bruises on him. I don't know if he fell or somebody said slammed his hand in the car door. I don't know. Uh, and also, if I wanted to do the shirt, I could also add to this if I wanted to just bring that back and let's take a look what we got there pretty cool so again we went from here normal boring plane to there that quickly pretty cool stuff alrighty uh, yes so start to finish and if you don't want the black and white, if you decide you don't want it, you can turn it off. Or maybe you want a little bit of black and white. Maybe I just want to desaturate part of the image. I can make that black and white layer and then bring the opacity slider down a little bit. So I get a little bit of color coming back. That looks pretty good. So I can hit F to go full screen and see my finished image. Love it. So, we've run out of time. Thank you all for spending time with us. Hope to see you online again soon. And until then, everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.